I would suggest as many spiritual directors and uh, uh, spiritual people in general, but especially those that are assisting others in spiritual growth, that one of the, one of the most important, if not the most important things that we can do to have equanimity, to have peace in the midst of chaos, to be in action and not be just totally overwhelmed by depressing, challenging, difficult times, is to, to really have our best understanding of reality, the reality of impermanence, the reality of mortality, the reality of death, and hold it in a sacred, meaningful, personal, and inspiring way. For a number of years, Connie uh, and I used charts back before we had uh, PowerPoint and Keynote and stuff like that. And this is one of the charts that we used whenever we did programs on, the, on a sacred science approach to mortality and death. We would take a look at the major sciences that have anything to do with death. Paleontology, evolutionary biology, embryology, cell biology, ecology, astronomy and astrophysics, geology and geography and math. And then we took a look at some of the major scientific discoveries in each of these areas that have helped us come to an understanding that there's not only nothing wrong with death, there is something profoundly right with death, that you can't have a universe without death. So here is a litany that religious congregations have used. I'm going to invite you to just respond with the refrain. When I do like this, you will all just ask, is this a universe we can say yes to? Stars are born and stars die. Along the way, these stars fashion the very atoms of our bodies. Mountains are born and mountains die. Along the way, these mountains create the particles of sand and clay that blend with dead plants to become soil. Is this a universe? Glaciers come and glaciers go. Along the way, they grind rocks into new soil and sculpt ponds and lakes. Is this a universe? Species come and species go. Along this odyssey of evolution, marvels emerge. Eyes, limbs, feathers, song, terror, love. Is this a universe? Cells are born and cells die. Along the way, the winnowing yields fingers and toes, fins and wings, and the miracle of healing from injury. Is this a universe? Yes, Forests of cells are born and die, but not let go. Along the way, these ancestors' cells stiffen into wood of uncommon strength and endurance, allowing the living green cells to reach for the sky. Is this universe? Yes, Baby animals are born in abundance, and myriad plant seeds are cast to the wind. Along the way, most of these children become food, supporting the vast ecological web of life. Is this universe? Yes, humans are born and humans die. Along the way, each may blossom with love and accrue, wi and accrue wisdom as elders, and then by their passing make room for generations of children now and forevermore. Ideas are born and ideas die. Along the way, they nourish the human journey onward, inward, and outward in an arc of wonder that now embraces a hundred billion galaxies. Love comes and love fades, dies, or endures. Along the way, we experience the richness of existence, sanctified by laughter and tears. Is this the universe? Each of us is born and each of us will die. Along the way, our awareness of death urges us to live fully, to give fully, and to take not one moment for granted. Death is natural and necessary at every level of reality. And the ancients could not have possibly known this in the ways that we do. That's why it's so vital that we continue to honor reality, whether we use God language or secular language, that we honor reality in terms of ongoing revelation and not get frozen in time. Death is no less sacred than life. And thus, Good Fridays are consistently followed by Easter Sundays. <laughs>
This is my cosmic rosary. Right? It's called, called great story beads. I mean, they're called different things by different people. But each bead signifies some significant event in the history of everyone and everything. This is the whole universe story. I consider each of these a grace moment. And one of the things that we understand from the history of the universe is that one of the main things that drives evolution and complexity and transform, transformation is chaos, breakdowns, and bad news. Turns out that nothing is more important than chaos, breakdowns, and bad news for catalyzing creativity, catalyzing transformation. And so again, this is seeing that death isn't a problem. Death is a necessity that, when embraced, can have life-changing import. In other words, Good Friday wasn't just something that happened to one God-man 2,000 years ago. It's a fundamental part of the nature of nature. The gifts of death. Mountains die. Oceans die. Continents die. Without the death of species, there would be no complex life. Without the death of fetal cells in the embryonic stage of development, we'd all be spheres. The reason we have shape is because cells died here, 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 and here. Without the death of plants and animals, there would be no food. I mean, this is obvious when we think about it, but we're just not used to thinking about death as a, in a positive way. Without the death of stars, there would be no periodic table of elements, no planets, no life. Without the death of elders, there would be no room for children. I mean, think about it. In a finite world, if all you have is birth with no death, very quickly, you're wall-to-wall -wall people, wall-to-wall -wall skunks, wall-to-wall -wall bacteria 60 feet deep. It doesn't take long. Death is essential on a finite planet. So without death, there would be no ancestors. Without death, time would not be precious. So what, then, are the gifts of death? The gifts of death are Mars and Mercury, Saturn and Earth. The gifts of death are the atoms of stardust within our bodies. The gifts of death are the splendors of shape, and form and color. The gifts of death are diversity, the immense journey of life. The gifts of death are food, the sustenance of life. The gifts of death are seeing, hearing, feeling, deeply feeling. The gifts of death are the urgency to act, the desire to fully be and become. The gifts of death are joy and sorrow, laughter and tears. The gifts of death are lives that are fully and exuberantly lived, then graciously and gratefully given up for now and forevermore. Amen. Now that too has been used as a litany in various churches. What matters most, of course, is our legacy. Whatever has given your life meaning, whatever the thousands of things that have given your life meaning, the final meaning of your life is your legacy. And David Brooks talked about this uh, in terms of the difference between an honorable death and a dishonorable death. David Brooks, back about six, seven years ago, wrote a piece in the New York Times on death and budgets. He said, we think the budget mess is a squabble between partisans in Washington, but in large measure, it's about our inability to face death and our willingness as a nation to spend whatever it takes to push it just slightly over the horizon. See, there are supernormal medical technologies that our ancestors never had to say no to. But many of us will have to say no to, otherwise this is the way we're going to die. Because this is the default position. This is what all the incentives have to go, you know, are moving us in. And what I sometimes say is imagine that this guy here is like 85 years old. He had a great life. He had an amazing legacy. And in his last seven months of life, he was kept alive like this at the cost of 48 college educations. What's his net legacy? It's real mixed. Supernormal medical technology creates the physical suffering, emotional distress, family discord, and humongous societal costs. Until we grasp that death plays a vital and necessary role in an evolving cosmos, Christianity will be shackled by unnatural, otherworldly notions of the gospel, Medical technologies will continue to prolong physical and emotional suffering and provoke family discord. The medical industry will continue to underwrite the widening gap between the rich and the poor. And seniors and their families will continue to be seduced into perhaps the greatest generational injustice and legacy diminishing evil in history. A few years ago, Connie had this amazing uh, vision of creating and trying to influence uh, insurance companies, that those of us who have this kind of a view, those of us who don't see death as an enemy or as the problem, but as sacred, 
and don't want to be kept alive just because we have the medical technology to keep our organs alive, don't want to be kept alive that way. That we can actually work with this actuarial analysis such that, because one of the things we do is we don't, we don't feel good about saying no unless somehow we can be a blessing. So that there's a percentage that then goes for uh, projects around the world, legacy projects, which then allow you to feel great about not having these life-saving technologies because there's already the insurance analysis. I've got several friends who think that Connie's idea is absolutely necessary. And so up on our website, thegreatstory.org, just slash legacy.pdf is just a four-page outline of that. So if you have any connections to the insurance industry or just even more curious about this, uh, please check out that PDF. One of the things we do a lot is visit graveyards. In fact, literally three nights ago, we slept in a graveyard because we were driving from North Carolina and I wanted a nice dark place to sleep because there were no truck stops and you got these 75 mile an hour roads through Texas. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Am I gonna pull off the side here and try to sleep? So we found a nice graveyard to sleep in. And I love it because one of the things that we do religiously is we'll look at the gravestones. We didn't do this the other night, but we'll look at the gravestones and we'll see that it wasn't that long ago that a lot of women died in childbirth and a lot of children under the age of five died. And then I'll look at the tombstones and I'll read the dates. And one of the things I'll often say to myself is, is, you know, whatever this person may have believed about his or her soul or spirit or consciousness, you know, whatever it was that they believed continued after death, that helped them live a good life. I am just nothing but a bow of gratitude and respect to that practical truth wisdom that maybe helped them. But from the perspective of every life form in the universe, this person is everlastingly dead. And I am soon going to be just as everlastingly dead in terms of my body, this material existence. Our supremely natural destiny is everlasting death. And that doesn't mean that you can't continue to have whatever beliefs that you might have that inspire you. But in terms of your material existence, we're all gonna be everlastingly dead soon. So that means, among other things, let's not put off our legacy work. Even if you're 90 years old, how you go through the dying process can be one of the most profound pieces of legacy that you, you ever contribute. A few years ago, there was a funeral director. This person uh, told Connie, she says, I'm a funeral director intern and will be getting my license within the next couple of months. Every day I deal with death. Every day I hear sermons about Adam's sin and death's sting. I always feel strange sitting in the back, listening to whichever preacher happens to be the pick of the day. I always knew I didn't believe what they spoke. I learned about evolution on the Discovery Channel, but I never had it put into a story that could define me. It was always something distant, something that happened in the past. You brought to me the first creation story that I could relate to. No talking snake in a tree tempting a nude woman. No, you gave me words to a story that is based in fact, something I can make my own, something that is my own. And for that, I thank you. One of our dearest colleagues in the religious naturalism movement, the sacred realism movement, is Loyal Rue. And I love this quote. Death is the entrance fee paid on exiting. Death is the entrance fee paid on exiting. Nine years ago, I went through a very serious bout of cancer, had a tumor the size of my fist and my spleen. And even when I was looking at the possibility that I could die in the next eight months, and there was a period of about a month where we thought that was the case until the chemo worked, I had what religious people call the peace that passes understanding. And it wasn't because I was holding out hope for pearly gates and mansions when I die. I'm a sacred realist. I'm a religious naturalist. It seems to me pretty clear that where we go to when we die is the same place we came from before we were born. And whether you speak of that as coming from God and returning to God, or coming from mystery and returning to mystery, or coming from nothing and returning to nothing, I think all those are legitimate ways of talking about it. But as I sometimes say, and I'm not just joking, I mean this, if where I go to when I die isn't the very same place that all other plants and animals and bacteria have gone, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> I don't think we humans get to go to some special place that the rest of the living biosphere doesn't get to go to. And I am eternally grateful. A year later, I had this experience. My only granddaughter, at the age of 14 hours, on my chest, wrapped up with a baby wrap. One of the highlights of my life. 
So I mentioned before Stephen Jenkinson, his documentary Grief Walker, Die Wise. I love this quote, not success, not growth, not happiness. The cradle of your love of life is death. Spiritual teachers and traditions talk about having your mortality always as your advisor. The life cycle, the mortality of unsustainable civilizations. You can get an awful lot just by going to this Wikipedia page. Just societal collapse. There's tons of great stuff linked just from that page. But these are some of the historians that really focused on not just history as understood as a linear like this or human-centered, but understood the patterns, the rhythms of history, and the commonality of how, how cultures become great and how they grow old and die. And so here are just some of the resources. The Collapse of Complex Societies by Joseph Tainter, Ronald Wright, A Short History of Progress, Collapse by Jared Diamond, The Fate of Empires by Sir John Glubb, I also recorded that. Technofix, and then these two overshoot, as I've mentioned many times already, and this book, Immoderate Greatness by William Olfels. It's just a little 75-page book, but oh my gosh, is it fabulous. It sums up the kind of research that these historians have done in 75 pages. And then John Michael Greer, I cannot speak too highly about. John Michael Greer is our favorite author. I've actually recorded most of these books.